Hello, listeners. Yamina here. Welcome to the Dr. GPCR podcast. Before we dive into this episode, I have a few announcements for you. We hope you were able to join us last month for the second edition of the Dr. GPCR Summit. It was a great week filled with amazing talks from amazing speakers from all around the world, including early career scientists. Find out more about the winners of the best talks given at the summit by the next generation of GPCR scientists by following us on social media today. Also, you can now watch the talks from the summit on our YouTube channel. Please subscribe today. You will get notified whenever we share new videos, and it is also a great way to support our work. Another great way to support us is by subscribing to the Dr. GPCR newsletter. The upcoming newsletter contains the summit survey. We want to hear from you. Tell us what you'd want us to keep, improve, and how to make Dr. GPCR work for you. Stay tuned for the upcoming Dr. GPCR Virtual Cafe events. Visit drgpcr.com to find out more about all our activities. And now, let's dive into this episode. Hello, everyone. This is Yamina from Dr. GPCR, and we are here uh, for another great episode of the Dr. GPCR podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of having with me Dr. Peter Banks. He is the Scientific Director at Biotech Instruments. Hi, Peter. Hi, Yamina. How are you doing? I'm great. It's great to have you on today. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Of course, of course. Um, so let's let's start at the beginning. Can you walk us through um, uh, through your career? Uh, you know, chronologically or not, as to how you got to where you are today. Yeah, it's um, it's a meandering path, should we say? Um, yeah, I, I know, I know. This is uh, this show is about uh, two protein coupled receptors. Um, I have to confess that um, my 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 training as a, a scientist is not in biology or pharmacology or anything like that. I'm actually an analytical chemist uh, by training. And uh, I sort of got into the GPCR field um, sort of sideways, I guess. Um, my, my expertise is more uh, around um, sort of separation science and fluorescence. And it's really the, the fluorescence part of it that uh, had me recruited by this really small startup company in Montreal. And they, um, they had a product line at the time, which was uh, fluorescently labeled GPCR ligands. And uh, they were selling those um, those products into academia, primarily for confocal microscopy uh, applications. So they were very most customers were interested interested in um, essentially visualizing and locating GPCRs and say tissue slices, things of that nature. Um, and the um, the product was selling, you know, not so much. Um, typical pricing for this was about uh, five hundred dollars a nanomole. And, you know, a customer would buy this amount and use it for, you know, perhaps a year. And um, they really wanted to go into different markets away from confocal microscopy and more into uh, drug discovery, where, um, you know, at the time, this was, um, this was just before um, 2000, it was 1998 that I started in this small startup. Uh, high throughput screening was just massive at that time. And uh, GPCRs were um, essentially, uh, I think just about all pharmas had, um, most of their screening campaigns were actually directed towards GPCRs at the time. So very, very hot gene family for drug discovery in general. And so um, the small startup wanted to try and take a slice of that big pie. And if you do the math, um, you know, most uh, high th throughput screening is conducted in microplates. And um, if you do the math about, you know, how much ligand you would use in a high throughput screen, and these screens were typically, a, you know, at least a, a million compounds in the screen. If you do the math, um, you could get more than 100 times your, uh, your revenue from one of these customers compared to an academic customer. So it just made sense to try and get into that marketplace. Uh, the problem was, you know, how to do it um, with these fluorescently labeled um, TPCR ligands. You know, at that time, uh, GPCR screening, that was right at the um, beginning of um, Flipper. And, you know, Flipper was just massive at that time. You know, every pharma didn't have one. Every pharma had five or six. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this was, this was great for screening uh, 
G alpha Q coupled um, receptors, you know, that um, that rely on the uh, the calcium flux. But um, you know, for G alpha um, I, G alpha S, you know, there was tricks molecular biologists could do to sort of induce these uh, GPCRs to go through um, a calcium flux uh, signal pathway. But um, you know, that, that's in a sense cheating. And you know, a lot of people just wanted to preserve the biology and um, you know get more of a physiological relevant assay so you know at the time um radioisotopes uh, was the principal way of labeling ligands and there was two main companies that did this uh there was any life sciences in the u.s and abersham in the uk and uh, they sort of were two uh 800 pound gorillas in the marketplace that essentially labeled uh, these gpcr ligands either uh, with tritium if they were small or i-125 and, you know, they sold these ligands into the academic market, much like we did with the fluorescent ligands. But they also had value-added kits um, for doing screening. So in the case of NEN Live Sciences, they had something called a flash plate, which actually had the, um, a scintillant inside the microplate. And so with a, say, a 125 label ligand that was bound to a receptor on that plate, you would get um, this scintillation and uh, you could quantify bound ligand. Um, on the Amersham side, they had something a little bit more um, uh, sort of homogeneous. They had the spa beads and uh, you know both the flash plate and the, um, the spa beads were functionalized uh, with wheat germ and gluten and that allowed um, these... Uh, solid substrates to essentially attach uh, cell membrane fragments to them. And of course, you know, those cell membrane fragments would have GPCRs overexpressed in them. So that was the platform. Um, and we wanted to get away from the use of radioisotopes. Um, you know, there's, there's safety issues, of course, there's exposure costs. So, um, you know, I think the marketplace was was ready for a shift away from radioisotopes. I mean, they're very, very sensitive, um, but uh, you know, just those two issues, I think, were enough for um, for the marketplace to want something different that was non rad, essentially. And so, we um, this small startup hired me in to try and figure out how to use these ligands in a drug discovery assay. So. You know, the first thing you'd think of would be something similar to, uh, you know, what uh, NEN had with the flash plate, except, you know, you'd use a filtration plate, again, in microplate format, 96 wells, and um, you'd be able to filter um, any um, unbound ligand away from um, the assay. So, you know, everything uh, that would be left would be uh, bound up ligand, and then you could quantify the fluorescence of that bound ligand. Um, we tried that. Um, it was, um, shall we say, the assay performance was not great. Um, the precision was really poor. And, um, you know, the assay window was okay, but um, when you look at the fluctuations of uh, your bound from your unbound, it was just, it was not a, a, an assay that you could actually uh, use. Um, so we were looking for another way of doing this. And, and certainly we wanted it to be more sort of homogeneous. So more of a mix and read assay. We don't have to rely on filtration. And so you can incorporate all these robots the, uh, the pharma companies were using for doing, um, for conducting these high through the screening campaigns. So, you know, automated uh, liquid dispensers that, of that nature. So it's, it's just essentially a sequential addition of reagents. You wait a certain amount of time and you measure your assay. So, you know, it allows you to get through a million compounds in a reasonable amount of time if you have that uh, sufficient automation. So <clears throat> one of the, uh, the technologies, detection technologies we were looking at was fluorescence polarization. And uh, this is typically a mix and read type of an assay. Um, and uh, the principle of uh, fluorescence polarization is all based on um, molecular rotation and the amount of rotation that occurs during the fluorescence lifetime of your fluorophore. So not to get into the physics of it all, but um, uh, when you look at a GPCR ligand, um, you know, if it's a peptide, you know, it's typically something anywhere from around, um, you know, s several hundred Daltons to, um, if, you know, if it's a protein, it's going to be uh, several uh, thousands of Daltons. But when you compare the size of that ligand to a piece of 
cell membrane. You know, it's very, very small. And so you can tell whether uh, that ligand is free in solution or, or bound to that cell membrane fragment um, and, uh, by using fluorescence polarization. And so that's what we wanted to do. Um, you know, at the time, um, we had a, um, it wasn't a microplate reader. It was a, um, it was called a polarimeter and it essentially worked with, um, test tubes. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. So the assay volume that we had to use was, um, it was on the order of, um, almost a mil. And so, you know, most micro titer places, 96, it'd be at least, um, you know, um, a fifth of that. But um, this is all we could afford at the time. We were a small startup, if you remember. And um, so, you know, the, um, the assay cost just in the receptor use for one mil was, was outrageous, of course. And, uh, you know, us being a small startup, we couldn't really do that. Um, so we partnered like crazy. So uh, we partnered with a company called Receptor Biology who made um, cell membrane preparations. And they had a, a pretty nice um, suite of um, different GPCRs that they overexpressed. And uh, they were typically uh, CHO cells or, or HEC-293 cells. Um, and so we got a lot of freebies from them. And as far as the microplate reader goes, there was, there was really three uh, vendors at that time. There was, um, there was Volok. Uh, they were a Finnish company, and they had uh, the Victor, a very nice instrument. Um, TCAN had um, uh, an instrument that could do fluorescent polarization called the Ultra. And then there was a, a, a small, hungry company called LGL Biosystems based out of Sunnyvale, California, and they had the Analyst. And we tried all three of those instruments in our, um, in our assay. And... We found that the um, the analyst was the only one that had the the requisite um, sensitivity to be able to measure um, uh, with precision uh, the fluorescence polarization signal. Um, if you look at this back on all three of those instruments, um, there's a fluorescence polarization spec in all three of them, which is um, which looks at um, one nanomolar fluorescence. And what they're looking at is the standard deviation in a one nanomolar fluorescing solution. And, um, you know, the, the analyst had um, a precision that was about three times better than the other instruments. So, you know, that was the one we wanted. Um, we couldn't afford one. <laughs> <laughs> so you had to partner. <laughs> you had to partner. So um, I actually, I spent a week in Sunnyvale um, doing experiments at LJL Biosystems to get proof of principle for uh, a number of systems. And memory serves, um, we had a fluorescently labeled deltorphin uh, with a mu opioid receptor. And I think we had a um, uh, NDP alpha MSH with a melanocortin 4 receptor. And, um, you know, we, we demonstrated um, very good, um, very good assay performance. If you remember at the time, um, there was um, the way assay performance was quantified. It was it was called signal to noise, and essentially all it did was look at bound um, ligand over uh, displaced ligand, and yeah. you know everything was radioisotopes. So there was there was an easy way of just sort of comparing. Um, assay performance across different detection technology that provided, you know, they use um, radioisotopes. But with fluorescence polarization, we found that, um, you know, the assay window wasn't anywhere as big as your typical uh, flash plate assay or spa assay. You know, that uh, window is about a factor of 10, whereas in fluorescence polarization, it was more like a factor of two. And so just looking at, you know, just the assay window, you'd think that the fluorescent polarization assay would be bad. But when you look at the precision of the data points in bound versus displaced, um, it was so much tighter with fluorescence polarization. And we were kind of fortunate at the time in that the um, paper came out in the Journal of Biomolecular Screening talking about um, Z prime, um, or in, in Canada we say Z prime. But um, yes. essentially, it, it looks at not only the assay window, but the precision at the top and the bottom of your window. And, you know, with that kind of a measure, 
we were able to demonstrate that fluorescence polarization was, you know, an excellent technique. You know, we had typically um, Z prime factor is well above uh, 0.5, which was indicative of a robust high throughput screening assay. And so, you know, we were we were really happy to, to generate this proof of principle data. We presented it at um, that. Um, if you remember, there, uh, there used to be an SBS conference. Um, we presented. It's sort of, uh, there was two conferences at the time. There was Lab Automation and SBS. They've since combined to do SLAS. SLAS. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, you know, back in that day, they were, they were separate. And um, the SBS was more of the, uh, I guess it was more towards the reagent side of drug discovery, uh, whereas Lab mm -hmm. Automation was more instrumentation focused on drug discovery. But, um, and we presented the results there. And the long and short of it is, um, one of those big um, companies, NEN, uh, NEN Life Sciences, liked our technology so much um, that, uh, and they sort of, they saw the market turning away from radioisotopes and wanting something non-rad. And so they were very interested in us. And um, I joined the company, I think, in uh, June of 1998. And by October of 1998, that was about a month after that SBS conference. Um, any in life science bought us. And so, wow. yeah. So um, they were very much interested in developing a, a product line of these fluorescent labeled uh, GPCR ligands and, um, you know, specifically for uh, high throughput screening. And so, um, you know, our small um, company, which had no money, all of a sudden had lots of money. <laughs> <laughs> so no more need to uh, to partner that much, although partnering is not a bad thing. Yeah, partnering is still good, but um, we were able to buy that analyst and, and have it in our lab. And that, that allowed us to um, develop this product line. Uh, it was called um, FP squared. And FP, of course, is fluorescence polarization and also fluorescent peptide. So FP squared, hence the name. And so... Um, we made these uh, these fluorescent-based ligands by uh, sort of conventional um, peptide synthesis. And so, you know, essentially using a resin to put one amino acid on the next one, you essentially gradually grow out um, your ligand. And um, on, the, uh, on the resin, uh, typically we would uh, label these, um, uh, these GPCR ligands when they're still on the resin and then purify them. Um, then um, there would be uh, some mass spec analysis to validate um, the, the correct uh, atomic weight of the, um, of the peptide. And then we'd do, um, um, we actually did this, we found this out, uh, they would do a, um, an assay of uh, sort of measuring the KI of the, of the, uh, the ligand in a radioisotope labeled assay. And um, you know, that would demonstrate its utility as, um, as, a, as a GPCR ligand. And so that was the basis of how we sort of grew up this product line. My job was not to do the uh, peptide synthesis, but to you know demonstrate these in high throughput screening assays. And so each kit that we developed, um, you know, had to had to have um, a, a series of data, um, you know, dose response curves with um, a specific uh, GPCR um, things of that nature. And so um, we. Um, we developed the product line up to about, um, I think we had at, uh, after about a year, something like around uh, 25 different kits. And, um, you know, that was making a pretty decent splash in the marketplace. Um, so much that um, a big corporation started sniffing around. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you've heard of Perkin Elmer, of course. Um, of course. <laughs> so in, in, I think it was 1999, they acquired um, Volok, who makes the Victor. Yeah, the Victor. That's yeah. right. And so um, Perkin Elmer at the time was more of an instrumentation type company, and they really wanted to pair reagents with instruments, specifically around drug discovery, because you know that that marketplace at the time um, was growing. You know, probably 20, 30 percent year over year. It was just crazy, crazy market. And so um, in 1999, they bought um, Volok, and in 2000, uh, they bought uh, NEN Life Sciences. So um, 
you know, I went from the small startup to a medium sized uh, business to this large yeah. corporation. And so it's, it's a bit of a head turning uh, series of events, I got to say. Um, but, uh, you know, with, with each one of these acquisitions, um, you know, the resources available to me was so much greater. <laughs> and so, you know, <laughs> we, we started working with the, uh, the Bullock folks at that time. You know, as I said, the Victor is a great instrument, but, you know, as far as fluorescence polarization and our specific application, um, it wasn't, you just didn't, didn't really make the cut compared to uh, LJL's uh, analyst. And so um, I spent quite a few, um, uh, quite a bit of time over in uh, Turku, Finland, working with their R&D scientists to come up with a, with an instrument uh, which would be better for this specific application. Um, and Turkey, by the way, is just a marvelous place. Um, I think the first time I went there was right at midsummer. And um, if you know um, where Turku is on the map, it's very, very uh, north. And uh, at midsummer, um, the sun really doesn't go down. <laughs> so you know, typically at midnight, you still be wearing your sunglasses. But um, oh God. <laughs> they, they're, they're great hosts. And um, I remember one, you know, my first visit there, they took us on a, um, on a trip through the, um, the archipelago just off the coast of, um, of Turku. And it's just a, a gorgeous string of uh, small islands. And we did this, this cruise through them and then had a salmon barbecue in one of these islands. It was just a pretty incredible time. Very, very good hosts. But, um, the upshot of it was, you know, over a period of maybe around um, 18 months or so, you know, together we we worked to um, improve upon what the Victor could do, and um, ultimately we came out with a with a new instrument, uh, which was very much designed for high throughput screening, and could do um, these um, these fluorescent polarization assays. And uh, that instrument was called the Envision, and uh, the Envision uh, I think uh, was launched. Uh, 2002 and you'll find it in so many uh, pharmaceutical companies it's just so prevalent a, a marvelous instrument and um, yeah working with those um, those Finnish engineers was, um, was was a really high point in my career I think they were great folks that's fantastic oh. I, I love I love how you're walking us through. I've never heard of, of these of these smaller companies. Yeah, yeah. So it's a great. I've worked with radioactive ligands to do mainly binding assays on GPCR, you know, expressing whole cells or on membranes, but not the the ninety six well plate type of assays. I think it's just a fantastic historical view of where we started when it came to came to high throughput screens to where we are today. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, as far as the um, the FP squared product line goes, I mean, we, we continued to you know build out the number of kits, but we also started looking at um, you know more functional assays. So, like the uh, like the flipper, um, we wanted to have something which could be um, used broadly across the uh, the gene family. And uh, you know, the first obvious uh, type of product to make was a cyclic AMP kit you know, based on fluorescent labeling um, cyclic A and B and, and having essentially a uh, competitive um, type of uh, uh, assay with it. Yeah. Um, so this was uh, antibody-based, and so um, we, um, we had to uh, develop um, our, our own antibody, of course, and uh, we had to label uh, this very small molecule and retain its... Um, its uh, physiological uh, relevance. Um, so we managed to do all that and came out with um, cyclic AMP kit right about that time. And um, yeah, that was a that was a marvelous seller. I think, I think that that product is still in the marketplace. Um, so in two thousand and two, um, another um, huge thing happened at um, at Perkin Elmer. Uh, it was again another acquisition, and um, this time was Packard Biosciences and um, you know that was Packard Biosciences was pretty much the same sort of size as Perkin Elmer at the time so it was mm -hmm. it was a bit of a messy integration I gotta say 
<laughs> but, um, you know, Packard Biosciences, they had a lot of instruments, a lot of reagents. And one of those um, reagents was, um, was alpha screen. And, um, you know, that, again, a very powerful detection technology. And they actually had a competing product with ours, uh, a cyclic AMP kit. Theirs was based on um, the alpha screen, ours on fluorescent polarization, of course. And um, alpha screen couldn't actually do ligand binding um, primarily because of um, you know the size of the beads. It just uh, sort of precluded having um, you know any sort of labeled uh, GPCR ligand because uh, the beads were much too big. But um, you know the functional assays it did very very well, and so. Um, we were both, uh, at the time, there was a, a Packard office in Montreal and um, our office for ending and life sciences in Montreal. And so Perk and Albert decided, those guys over there, Packard Biosciences, are bigger, so you guys are going to have to leave where you are and go go live with them. So we came together and, uh, you know, all of a sudden, you know, I've got, um, I'm working with uh, both uh, the fluorescent polarization product line and also the... Um, the alpha screen product line and um at that time there was a decision that um alpha screen makes way much more money is growing way much more than the fluorescence polarization product line so you know resources essentially moved away from developing the fp squared product line and at the time we were trying to develop um, more functional assays for gpcrs at the time we were trying to uh, develop an ip3 kit which would uh, be uh, useful for the, the GQ couple receptors. Um, yep. That was a that was a tough slog, but um, we we eventually never actually came out with a with a product. We just couldn't get the requisite um, assay performance for a high throughput screening campaign, unfortunately. But we spent a lot of time working on it. But um, yeah, so. Um, you know, the FP, I don't think uh, there's any sales of the, the FP Square product line anymore. Um, you know, the upshot eventually was, um, you know, the, the fluorescent labels are so much larger than, you know, the radioisotopes. And, um, you know, getting uh, physiological relevance in smaller ones is difficult. Um, making protein gpcr ligands by peptide synthesis is, is not really an option <laughs> and uh, you know trying to label recombinant um, uh, gpcr ligands is expensive and so you know there's a sort of a niche area for this product line which you know we, we sort of difficult or too um too um economically difficult uh to expand the product line further so it um Peter, you broke up there for a second. Uh, you froze, and the last thing I heard was about the how expensive it was to label um, proteins, uh, protein ligands for GPCRs. Sorry about that. You, uh, is it better now? No worries. Is it better now? Yes, much better. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, labeling protein GPCR ligands is just not viably uh, economically, and so. Um, you know, we stopped developing that product line at that point. And, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, I sort of moved away from reagents development within Perkin Elmer, became much more of a sort of a, a business development person. And um, I, I lasted at that uh, position probably, um, you know, only a couple of years before I decided to move to uh, biotech instruments. And um, that, um, that's a, a sort of a, uh, a much more different role than I was used to. You know, I, I sort of had this business development experience and this um, R&D yeah. uh, development experience. But in biotech instruments, um, I was sort of responsible for the complete scientific content of, uh, of biotech. Um, you know, we were yeah. a relatively small company at the time. You know, we had probably about um, 200 employees globally. And a lot of those were either manufacturing or sales. Um, the R&D department uh, at Biotech Instruments was exclusively engineers. And so they had no sort of experience in um, the applications that their customers would typically do, you know, like GPCR um, drug discovery. And so 
my role in biotech was to sort of bring that scientific knowledge to bear, develop applications with our instruments to demonstrate that they could be used in all this broad yep. area of applications. And of course, um, you know, with my uh, my experience around GPCR reagent development, you know, those are some of the first things that I would do. <laughs> and so again, you know, it was back to partnering. Um, partnering <laughs> with reagent companies. I mean, that's, uh, you know, sort of took me all the way back to, uh, you know, my startup days. Um, but, um, you know, that's essentially what we do. We, we develop relationships mm -hmm. with a whole series of uh, reagent providers, uh, companies like um, Promega was a, was a huge um, partner of ours. Um, CISBio at the time was a huge partner of ours. And of course, they're, yep. they're heavily into GPCRs. Um, and, um, yeah, so we also absorbed by Brick and Elmer by now. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so Alpha Screen versus TR Fret yeah. or HTRF. Yeah. Uh, under the same same umbrella. But uh, be before we continue talking about biotech and your role at biotech, I have a couple of questions going sure, let's, of going back a little yeah. bit. So fellow Canadian here, yes. uh, I saw that you completed your PhD in analytical chemistry at the University of British Columbia. Correct. Uh, what led you to Montreal? Was this first job at this uh, biotech, at this start startup that led you to Montreal? Um, actually, I, I grew up in Montreal, um, personally, oh. at least. Um, you know, I, I did, um, I think, uh, around um, three years of elementary school and two years of secondary school there. Um, mm -hmm. My parents had, um, had um, emigrated from uh, the UK. Um, I was actually born a, a British subject. And uh, became Canadian when I was about four years old. Uh, but uh, we we lived in Montreal, and so um, you know I, I left Montreal as a as a pretty young man to uh, it was more of a sort of a blue collar kind of um, work experience I had working on fishing boats, working in the oil industry. Um, you know, before I was about um, I guess uh, I was about twenty two, twenty three, realizing that. You know, this is not the life for me. I want to go back to school. And so I was, I was a, a late bloomer, shall we say. And, um, you know, um, I, I loved Vancouver at the time. And so that's why, you know, I did both undergrad and grad at, uh, at UBC. But, um, you know, I had these roots in Montreal. And when I, um, when I got my PhD, um, I was looking for a, a faculty position. And a position came up in Concordia University. And... Um, you know, that, that was perfect for me. You know, my, my, my parents still lived in Montreal, so it was a pretty easy decision to, uh, to, to move to, to Montreal. To go back home. Yeah. That's fantastic. And I, I love, I love how, how versatile your, your career has been, you know, from analytical chemistry, from, from doing other, other odd jobs, like you mentioned, uh, fishing, uh, working on fishing boats. I don't know a lot of PhDs who have done that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then, uh, and then you mentioned that uh, mer under Perkin Elmer, merging the two Montreal sides of the two companies, um, where was that in Montreal? For for those who actually know the different suburbs and parts of Montreal. Yeah. So the um, um, the the site that we were in with any in life sciences was on uh, Royal Mount Avenue, and so that's um, way up the Dakari, the north end of the island, and um, mm -hmm. uh, there's a there's a research institute called the BRI, and uh, we had um, we had labs in that facility. Um, to uh, to go to the Packard Bioscience site, you go all the way down the carry <laughs> to uh, essentially <laughs> pretty much the Lachine Canal, and um, that's where you'd find uh, it's the uh, the site was um, was originally um, for the the company called Biosignal and Packard Biosciences mm -hmm. bought uh, Biosignal, I think, uh, 1998, something like that. Yeah. Wow. So it changed the commute for a lot of people from, well, yeah. from, from your yeah. office. <laughs> I was actually, yeah, I was, because, uh, I, was, I was happy not to have to negotiate the carry or, um, you know, the, the Trans Canada, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm saying because I know that you know traffic. Well, traffic in every big city is a problem, but I think Montreal is also in that problem area whenever it comes to to traffic. Oh, it's nuts, and it's just got worse, right? <laughs> With time, it did. It did. All right. So that that was my my kind of question going back. Um, so let's go back to to biotech instruments. So you're working with. With engineers who know how to put together a plate reader, but you're here as a scientific director, 
and you're trying to, you know, put together an instrument with an application that long term has use in 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 screen screens, but also could be used in academic settings. You know, anything yeah, that has to do with absolutely. science. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean. The thing about plate readers is, you know, they can do so many different things. It's, and so it's, um, it's an interesting job in that, um, you know, it's not just drug discovery, you know, it's not just GPCRs, uh, but it's, you know, we, we have customers um, in agriculture, for example. And, um, you know, they, they use different types of reagents or, you know, they use some sort of intrinsic property of their analyte. Um, but, um, you know, just the breadth of applications that our customers use our instruments with is just, it's astounding to me. Uh, but it certainly allows you to, to wear a lot of hats and do a lot of different applications. Um, I must confess, you know, my experience is more towards the drug discovery end of things. And so, you know, a lot of our collaborations were, were based on on drug discovery applications. And so, you know, the companies I tended to work with um, extensively, Promega, I've already named Sysbio. I actually uh, was able to work with Perkin Elmer too, which, uh, you know, even though they're, you know, a definite competitor from a microplate reader yeah. perspective, you know, they're such a big company that, um, you know, they, they rarely, um, they really sort of have a, a business leader who looks at, um, you know, the profit and loss of both instruments and reagents. They have individuals that do that. And so they're looking to maximize, you know, their revenues and um, for each one of those divisions. And so, you know, we were able to work more with the reagents folks and um, use their uh, reagents on our instruments. And, you know, everyone benefited from that. They sell more reagents. We sell more readers. So. More instruments. Yeah. That's fantastic. So uh, I have to say this. I am not being paid to say this, but I do love biotech plate readers. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and my my first uh, exposure to to buy. So when, as you must know, so I've done work on GPCRs, and uh, my background in in studying GPCRs is signaling and using breath technologies. And initially, I had uh, learned the technology with the breath hold instrument instrument. Um, the Mithras, but then I moved to New York doing my postdoc and at the high at the high throughput research center or high throughput facility that we had at Rockefeller, they had an Envision, which was getting old um, at that time. And they had uh, all sorts of versions of the biotech instruments. So it was uh, the H1, then the H4, then the Synergy, the Synergy, you had them all. And I really I always enjoyed working with the instrument. I found it very reliable and I found using the software really awesome as well, especially when it came to exporting data. Yep. Uh, because, you know, you, you need, if you want to analyze data, especially if you're, you're doing kinetic measurements, you really want that data to be organized in, in a certain way in order for you to do the, the analysis afterwards. And, as I said, I'm, I'm biased, not mm -hmm. absolutely not paid. You and I have never talked about this, but I really love the quality of, of the instruments. Well, thanks for that, Yamina. Mm -hmm. um, it was a, it's been a really lovely experience working at Biotech. Um, it, it takes me back to um, you know the collaborative types of work I did at Bollock, where you know we're, we're working with those Finnish engineers, and you know I've had the um, I've had the uh, the luck to work with uh, some really world class engineers at Biotech as well. You know, when I first joined uh, in 2008, um, we had the uh, the Synergy 4, uh, which um, became the Synergy H4, which I think you, you've, uh, you've worked with. But it's really been really interesting seeing the progression of the, uh, of the instruments as they've developed over the years. Um, you know, the flagship product that we have right now is Synergy uh, Neo 2. And, um, you know, that really yeah. has been designed for, you know, high performance work and so we, we do yeah. tend to sell those um to a lot of pharma customers who used to like the envision so you know it's sort of coming full circle <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. You know, yeah. but you know it's just been a, a marvelous um decade working with um with the engineers again you know we work very closely with these folks and mm -hmm. um yeah it's, it's been a real pleasure um i guess it was um it's getting on for eight years now that, um, you know, we took the concept of a microplate reader a little bit further by putting um, an inverted microscope in, uh, in essentially the body of a Synergy H1. That's essentially what we do. 
Um, so, you know, you have the same sort of box. Um, everything above the, the microplate carrier is the H1, pretty much, you know, microplate reader. And everything below that microplate carrier is um, the microscope. And, um, you know, that just sort of opens up so many more applications that you can, you can handle with, uh, with a microplate reader. And, um, you know, that's, that's been, um, that's been a marvelous ride as well. Um, you know, our excursion into, um, I sort of saw that, um, Kirk and Elmer just before I left, you know, that was when, um, you know, um, high content screening was, was the buzzword. You know, it was, I think it was around 1998 that, um, Salomix, you know, first came to the market, um, with their array scan. And I think, you know, all the big, um, the big vendors in uh, that were participating in the HTS market, you know, saw that as a as a growth engine, and everyone wanted to jump on board. And uh, you know, you had all these big corporations buying these small little companies. Um, you know, eventually, um, Perkin Elmer did acquire um, Evotech, and uh, you know, they had the um, the Opera system, uh, which you know, at the time, uh, and that's two thousand and seven when they when they acquired them. Um, I think an opera uh, listed for something like about one point five million dollars. <laughs> wow! <laughs> so a bit of a crazy price tag, and you know our idea of putting microscopy into something like a plate reader was not to go to that extravagance, but to, mm-hmm. you know have something affordable, something that you you know you didn't have to have a, you know a massive equipment grant to buy. And so, you know, we wanted to cost these things out at about the same price as a microplate reader, you know, but with a little bit added functionality. So, you know, the price tag had to be uh, below $100,000. And, you know, that's, that's essentially what we did. We, you know, we put this microscope into a you know, relatively small box. Certainly, when you compare the footprint of one of our citations to an opera, you know, it, it's about a fifth of the size. And, you know, it's about a fifth of the cost, too. Uh, but you know, yeah. <laughs> it, it gets you you know about eighty to ninety percent of that functionality that the opera has. So um, you know that's been um, that's been a marvelous uh, product for us in the um, um, over the last eight years for sure. The, the growth in um, in that product line has just been uh, you know, we're around thirty to forty percent year over year each year for eight years. So it's, it's done really well. Lovely. I've used the Neo 2 mm-hmm. as well, the Neo. I've even purchased a Neo 2 for, for a previous oh, uh, yeah. company yeah. that I worked for, mainly because I had a great experience with the previous versions. But also the goal was, well, fit within a budget, obviously, but have a reliable instrument that would not only fit the type of experiments that I was trying to run, but also would fit other experiments that other colleagues were doing. Mm-hmm. And the, and and for us at that point, this fit, you know, that box fit whatever we needed to do. You could quantify DNA, you can quantify proteins, mm-hmm. you can run uh, HTRF assays, you can run BRET assays, BRET1, BRET2, you name it, you had all the filters and it was just amazing. It was, you knew that the data that you got out was reproducible, reliable, and it was really a fun, fun thing. I did not use the citation for microscopy purposes, but one of your colleagues um, at, at Biotech hooked me up with a, with a, a scientist who had a citation in order just to read a, a luminescence. And I, you know, using the same sw- software, what a great idea. Yep. You've learned it once, you can use it anytime. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the microscopy is... Um sort of adds several layers on top of capability, of course. Um, And in some cases, you know, it can actually improve um, assay performance over a conventional plate reader. I'll I'll give you one example. Um, One of the the companies that we've partnered with um, over the years is uh, is called Montana Molecular. And um, yeah, 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 you would know them. <laughs> they, they make some great live cell reagents, you know, basically around, um, you know, second messages for GPCR signaling. So um, we've worked with them. They've actually bought um, one of our uh, readers. Um, but um, in some of their um, some of their assays, you know, specifically around, um, I think we've got data uh, for their um, cyclic AMP sensor and also their um, R gecko sensor, which measures calcium. Um, but um, with imaging, you're able to use the power of microscopy to isolate on specific 
cells that um, respond above a certain threshold. And when you do that, instead of you know sort of signal averaging the whole um, the whole cell population, you're looking at specific performers, and that allows you to you know get much more improved assay performance. So we've been working with them, sort of demonstrating the power of imaging relative to plate reading. Um, in that case, um, you can't beat plate reading for speed, of course, but um, you know if you want to tweak your assay, um, you know microscopy is a good way to go. What were some of the difficulties you faced while, uh, you know, putting together the citation and combining microscopy with, with, with a plate reader, basically in the same box? Yeah, we were fortunate um, to have um, one, of our, um, one of our optical engineers um, used to work at um, GE Healthcare. And so he was very familiar with the in-cell analyzer. And... Um, I think it was with him that, uh, you know, we were really able to, you know, get that design to where it needed to be from, you know, both a, a simplicity, a cost, and a performance perspective. And we were kind of fortunate in our timing um, because, you know, there was developments in the field, um, you know, with the, uh, with the iPhones, of course, um, camera technology is improving every, every month, it seems. And, uh, you know, it, it, at that point, um, you know, CMOS cameras, um, inexpensive ones were available. Um, LED technology had improved vastly, you know, very, very bright. They last forever, essentially, you know, 5,000 hours of operation. So bringing all these, these components together, um, you know, allowed us to build this inexpensive, um, inexpensive uh, microscopy technology and put it in that Synergy H1. I mean, it, it took a, a you know quite a bit of um, time. And certainly, probably the principal challenge was not the, um, the hardware; it was, it was the software. And um, you know, that's something that we had to learn. Um, we uh, you know we didn't have much um, knowledge in um, in image analysis al algorithms, but um, you know we, we were able to um, you know get the right people in to do that. I think that was the principal challenge was you know just getting the appropriate image analysis um, um, software available. And you know that's that's a work in progress in over the years. You know we we add modules, things like spot counting for for looking at mitochondria, for example, or you know um, various uh, vesicles within uh, within the cell. Um, so it's an ongoing um, uh, R&D development project for us, just augmenting our image analysis software. I love that. So I think I think sometimes you know when you when you start a project and you do it at the right time, where all of these tools are available, that's when you can do it fast and and well. Yep. And in that in that regard, based on what you were saying, you 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 had the idea of doing this at the right time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, what does the future hold for for biotech and and for you? How uh, and the, before you answer that, how did your role change at biotech from two thousand and eight until now? Yeah, it was remarkably consistent for you know a decade, <laughs> and then you know another acquisition in my life sort of turned up. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're still learning um how you know our roles will change but um you know Angela has been um remarkably patient with us we're still not um fully integrated into Angela that's going to happen um before the end of the year this year but um you know we have a pretty good idea of um of how our roles will change um you know, there's there's certain certainly obvious things that are going to change. Um, you know, our website will essentially be taken down. We will be part of the Agilent.com, their website. Um, our our processes will become Agilent processes. Um, you know, the internal things. Um, our CRM will become more of an Agilent based CRM. So all all these obvious changes are going to happen, of course. You know, as far as my group goes, I have a I have a team of um, six um, PhD level scientists. I don't think our role is going to change too much. I think we've been able to convince Agilent that um, you know the way we do business, which is you know really sort of scientifically focused, not just in my group 
But um, if you look at our, our our sales team, specifically um, in in the U.S., but you know this is, this is similar in globally as well. Um, you know, each one of our sales reps essentially can call on a PhD level scientist. We call them field application um, scientists, and um, you know these these folks know the applications. Uh, my team interacts with uh, with the field application scientists pretty extensively. Um, Actually, every year we have a training session where we'll bring those um, FASs in-house to our um, facilities in uh, in Minuski, Vermont, and uh, train them about our you know our latest um, instruments and uh, the latest applications. And so, you know, there's a really good symbiosis um, between us and those field application scientists because not only do we train them, but they bring in information from the field to us, which is which is perfect. So we, we, we've got a good um, finger on the pulse of, um, you know, what are the pertinent applications our customers are doing? So, you know, it's, 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 it's a great, great relationship. Um, I don't think that's going to change. Um, I, I think Agilent sees the value in that cooperation. Um, but we shall see. We shall see. I mean, I, I think uh, my team's role won't change too much. I think my role may. Um, mm-hmm. I, um, I wore a few hats when I was at biotech. Um, one of those additional hats was more of a strategic marketing kind of focus where I'd, I'd look at, you know, adjacent markets to where, um, we were typically um, playing and just doing an analysis about whether or not our instruments could go into that adjacent market. Or um, there could be a tweak to our instruments to better play in that market. So I think that's a role that I'm going to be doing a little bit more um, at Agile than I was at uh, Biotech. But I think with all the hats that you've worn throughout your career, it's it's just something that naturally comes comes to you. Yeah, yeah. And Being I, able I, to, you know, I enjoy it. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> but, that's all that matters. Yes, I have to, I have to say, as I mentioned, uh, I did have interactions with the, with the sales team at Biotech and also with the uh, with the FASs. And uh, what came through is deep knowledge of the instruments, but also a fantastic company culture at Biotech. Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the, one of the nice things sense. about Agilent is I think they have that same culture. They certainly respect it. So, yeah, things are looking good, I think. Which is fantastic. I think it's uh, new challenges, new resources. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Maybe yeah, uh, yeah. the level of partnering would, will change, but uh, I think still the the quality of, of the instruments that I've worked with, and this is, again, nobody has paid me to, to say this, but the quality of the instruments at Biotech that I've worked with, I, I was always in awe and that I never had to suspect that something was wrong with the plate reader and and it must have been the normally it was always the cells, yeah. never my hands, never the plate reader. <laughs> but uh, but I think I think that's that's a really really good thing. Um, I have a, I have a, one or two last questions before we wrap up. And, and most of our audience or a lot of people who listen to the podcast are young scientists, um, PhD level, sometimes masters or postdocs. Even a lot of them are in academia. So um, what would be your advice? To, to these young scientists who want to work in industry? Yeah. It, working in industry is a little bit different to working in academia, that's for sure. Um, I think it, um, you know, science is, 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 is great. It's interesting. And it's going to get you your first job for sure. Um, I, would, um, I would try and diversify um, your knowledge and experience. Um, not just focusing completely on um, on the science, but um, you know more mm-hmm. on um, you know the ability to do other types of things within that company. Um, you know, it can be anything you choose to do. Um, you know, I've had um, I've had some of uh, my colleagues, um, you know, with, from a scientific background, choose to you know look at um, patents law things like that and that just makes you know that person so much more um interesting to that company and you know furthering their careers um you know there's patent law there's you know looking at um, more the business side of things looking at more the marketing side of things so 
I think if you try to wear as many hats as possible, it, um, it really uh, helps you certainly in an industry setting, being able to do um, work with many different teams um, and, uh, you know, just, you know, getting your visibility to the, uh, the higher ups, it's um, certainly going to enhance your career. I think that's, I think that's something I tried to do in my industrial career. And something I had to sort of learn along the way, but um, you know, I think I think that's been uh, you know certainly instructed for me. Thank you, thank you, Peter, for that. I think yes, it's fantastic advice. Being, I mean, doing science is great, but uh, oftentimes, and I'm I'm speaking for experience. When I used to be in academia and work in the lab, I was so absorbed and focused by my own quote unquote little project that it was difficult to look around. Yeah. And, you know, take a break from that and, and learn something new. And also, yes, t- I think taking the break from your day-to-day pipetting allows you to become a better scientist and also to learn other skills that can be valuable in the future for your career, but also to future employers. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. And with this, I want to say thank you so much, Peter. It's been a pleasure talking to you today. Well, thank you, Amina. My pleasure as well. Thank you for listening to the Dr. GPCR podcast. I'd like to thank our guest, as well as our team members, Attila Forrest, Shivani Sajdev, Ines Pinero, and Alexa Juran. We look forward to seeing you live at the next Dr. GPCR virtual cafe. Visit drgpcr.com slash virtual dash cafe for more information. Also, please subscribe to the Dr. GPCR newsletter today. You can also find us on YouTube. And if you like our podcast, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. You can also leave us a testimonial at drgpcr.com slash testimonials. Another great way to support us is to share your favorite Dr. GPCR program with your network and colleagues. Also, email us with any questions and suggestions at hello at drgpcr.com. Until next time, stay safe.